Hello, I am Jim Varecki, Executive Director of Atlanta Master Corral. And on behalf of the Corral, I welcome you to our Spirit of Conversations Behind the Scores program. We continue the spirit of our organizational mission to inspire and enrich the lives of our community. And we're very grateful for so many who financially support Atlanta Master Corral and our ongoing programming. Today's guest is a very, very dear friend of Atlanta Master Corral and a key resource in the world of composing, publishing, copyright, licensing. Uh, I'm anxious for the conversation to begin. And so uh, to begin the program, I'm introducing our artistic director, Eric Nelson, who will start the program. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's my great privilege to welcome to our conversation today, Mark Lawson, who is the president of E.C. Shermer, ECS Publishing Group and Morningstar Publishers. The, this is a chance for those of you who are patrons of Atlanta Master Crowd to get a little bit of a look behind the curtain about uh, the music that we sing and where, where we find it. Also to find out a little bit more about the Atlanta Master Corral Choral Series and how that came about. And to learn uh, about Mark and who he is and how one gets to be uh, the president of a company like this. And so Mark, welcome. Great to be here, Eric. Uh, people would be uh, maybe interested to know that you have done a lot of these sorts of interviews as the interviewer, right? You've been interviewing composers and conductors uh, as one of the things that you've done uh, in the COVID pandemic pivot. Um, and in fact, you and I have had this conversation, uh, have not had this conversation, but have had conversations a couple of times where you interviewed me about one thing or another. So um, I'm glad to turn the tables on you today. It's, it's, it, it, I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for those who don't know, uh, or for those who might want to know a little bit more, tell us about the company. It's got a couple different names in it, which is sure. complicated. Um, so give, give us the, the, the overview of, of what the company is and how it works. I have often said that our company mission was to have the most names of any publishing company in the country, that that was our, our main mission. <laughs> so, um, you know, publishing uh, has always been a kind of an interesting thing about whether or not you keep the branding names of older companies as they are sometimes purchased and brought into newer companies and, and exactly how that works. And so for us, um, the first company in, was E.C. Shermer Publishing, which is 100 years old this December. And um, that was started in Boston. And then it later on was uh, the distributor for Galaxy Music Publishing, which was in New York. And during that time, many of the publishers were very regional uh, because the company, the country didn't have the kind of resources to do things all over the country like they did. And so things revolved in regions and you would see these catalogs develop by who's in their region. So E.C. Shermer was very New England oriented and built around connections with Harvard and things like that. Galaxy was very much built around New York and had a strong Juilliard connection and uh, developed as a New York company. In 1987, Morningstar Music Publishers was born in St. Louis. And that, all of these were separate at this point. Um, and it grew out of uh, the need for church music and involved with um, a, a particularly growing out of some of the splits that were happening in the Missouri Synod Church at the time. And so Morningstar was born. So how these all came together was that um, in about 1985, E.C. Shermer bought Galaxy and became ECS Publishing. And then uh, in 1997, we were able to Morningstar uh, purchase ECS. And so it came together. And so we became the ECS Publishing Group. And it has EC Shermer, Galaxy, and Morningstar all doing slightly different thing, but uh, working together to cover many different markets. So that's, in a nutshell, how this kind of worked. That's fantastic. And how did you end up um, being being where you are? Uh, is it th through a business background or a music background or a bit of both? A little bit of both. Um, 
you know, I grew up actually in a rural area in Southwest Missouri on a farm and my dad owned a hardware store. And so I would work in the hardware store. And so I always had this little bit of kind of business thing going on just because of working in the hardware store with my dad. But I was very interested in both farming and in, uh, in music. And so as I go through, as most people do in their lives, certain influences start overshadowing other influences, shall I say. And so actually in high school, um, our high school was very much a band school and less of a choral school. And, uh, but the band director also conducted the choir and it was really quite good. And he encouraged me at one point to try out for this new thing that was called the Missouri All-State Choir, which was the first year that that had ever happened. Wow. And Paul Salmunovich was our conductor. And I sat in that choir and it was the first time I really ever experienced just this transcendent moment, I suppose, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's when I kind of thought, this is what I would like to do, you know. So things shifted at that point, and I started becoming more and more and more involved in music. I had a um, music uh, education background, church music background. I went and did my master's study. None of it with thinking that I would be in the business aspect. But when I was in my graduate school, I was asked to start to write curriculum for children. Mm -hmm. And I started doing things in the publishing world as a, as a contributor and as a writer, uh, came out and made friends with the new owner and the person who began Morningstar Music Publishers and thought, this is of interest to me. And I started doing things with them and gradually kind of grew into the business and then ended up t taking over that position. And uh, then we were able to buy E.C. Shermer. So that's kind of how I got to where we are today. Uh, and that was many years ago now, but it was a kind of a natural progression, basically because I loved literature and I loved uh, seeing how that worked and involved with, with composers. And I, actually when I was a master's student, had the opportunity to be Randall Thompson's gopher for the weekend I when he the came in for a composer right. workshop and also Paul Mons in the same year, never knowing that I would have the responsibility for both of those catalogs later on in my life. That's yeah, pretty amazing. I see uh, uh, Randall Thompson's pictures behind you there. Yes, he, he haunts me. He's back <laughs> over here over my shoulder, making sure I do things right. Very, very nice. Um, I don't know whether you would have uh, these, these numbers at your uh, in your immediate disposal, but I'm curious hearing you talk about how different companies came together and how they've continued to grow since, of course. Um, do you have any sense in general how many single titles are mm -hmm. in the catalog? So when we purchased ECS, there were roughly 15,000 titles in that catalog. And there was roughly 5,000 in Morningstar. So that was about 15,000 and that was five years ago. And we've added a lot since then in many different genres. So uh, it's pretty large. <laughs> You say many different genres. The, uh, the Morning Morning Star and and how I first found you was the um, publishing of sacred music, sacred choral music, um, which can be targeted or or useful for the church. There's lots of church choirs all over who are always looking for quality music, but also sacred music is done by all other choirs as well. So. Is the catalog entirely sacred? No. So the Morningstar catalog is primarily sacred. Uh, it, it is 99% sacred. Um, the Galaxy catalog is very much a school uh, concert catalog. So primarily the music in Galaxy is secular or if it is sacred, it's con what I would call concert sacred, you know. Right. And then E.C. Shermer is kind of evenly split actually between concert sacred, sacred, 
uh, you know, and, and school oriented things. So um, it, it's really shaded about 50-50 now on whether it's uh, what I would call school. So we divide into three categories. We divide it into school, uh, church, and concert. And concert could be more of a professional level or a co upper collegiate level kind of material. Um, is it all, it's not all sacred, but is it all choral? No. So on the Morning Star side, we do organ, piano, organ and instruments, uh, piano and instruments, handbells, books about church music. Um, so anything that kind of circles into the needs of the, of the church is really what that Morning Star side is. On the um, E.C. Shermer and Galaxy side, we have a very strong opera and vocal uh, catalog. We have orchestral works uh, on that side. We, we have four Pulitzer Prize winning collections that were over the years. The Crucible, for example, is uh, one of the most performed American operas. Um, then we have on that side as well, there's a lot of things in the rental department that have to do like the ballet music of Rieti. Uh, so there's, there's quite a catalog of different things here. Uh, guitar, there's uh, harp yeah. music. Uh, so it, it's quite a variety of titles on the Galaxy and E.C. Shermer side. That is, a, that is a lot to keep track of, I'm sure. It is, and, I, and one of the way, and this might be of interest about the way the publishing companies were often formed, um, even though now most publishing companies have a specific genre, many publishing companies were, for, particularly on the classical side, were formed because they would make a relationship with an exclusive contract with a particular composer. And so the catalog would be formed by what that composer wrote. If that composer wrote opera, you published opera. If they wrote orchestra, you published orchestra. Mm -hmm. If they wrote choral. So people like Randall Thompson, who wrote across genres, or in more recent times, David Conti. David Conti has choral music, he has orchestral music, he has guitar music, marimba music. He's got, so it makes the catalog broader because you're representing the works of a particular composer. In a typical year, pre-COVID, um, about how many new pieces do you publish then? So on the choral side, so I'll kind of break it into genres. On the choral side, uh, often we publish twice a year and the Morningstar side would publish around 75 to 80 choral pieces a year. And the EC, ECS side, a little less than that, uh, usually about 60 pieces a year. So that's on the choral side, about 130. And then there would be um, a couple of books, usually about 15 to 20 keyboard products of different kinds, whether it be organ, piano, some instrumental things. Uh, so total, you would have to say around 200 things a year. Yeah. So it continues to grow and, and to expand. Your website is fantastic, if I may say so. Thank um, you. And in, in part, um, that's really important, I think, because it is the job of publishers, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, to always remind the patrons, people like me that are always looking to program upcoming season concerts, to always tell us kind of what new things are out there, things that we might be interested in. And sometimes those new pieces are exactly what we're looking for and they're just fantastic to add uh, freshness and currency to the program. But my goodness, there's a lot of great pieces which exist that are not new. And I find the ability to search your website, which you are constantly tweaking in terms of uh, what search terms we might use to, to get to what we're looking for is really, really good. So uh, okay. is that something that you grapple with is how to do the new and the old? It is very much so. Um, that is a, it's, it's a, it's basically a, the problem we have all of the time because you want to bring new things into the world, but you do not want to forget the gems from the past at the same time. And, you know, it's interesting how different 
kinds of groups program. For example, um, very few church programs, you know, they build around the church year, they build around scripture, they build around what, you know, the World Communion Sunday, they build around these kinds of things, which is a completely different set of topics than the school people want. School people want, what do I have for graduation? What do I want for my spring program? What do I want for my, do I need a Thanksgiving themed piece or a Halloween type? What do I, what am I doing here? And what do I want my uh, students to learn? You know, who, what great poet, what great, you know. And then on your community choir side, they're going, I'm gonna theme my concert. So I'm picking a theme and what do you have around the civil war? Like for example, well, you don't care if that's new or if it's old, I want it to fit my theme. Right. So how do you in a website do all of that? You know, So you, we developed different areas where you could tag different topics based upon. So that's why you kind of have to choose. I'm looking at church or I'm looking at school because there's a different set of topics, different set of search criteria based on that. So it takes a lot of thought, but we really think about what does the person coming to the website, how do they want to search? Um, how, what kind of things are they looking for? And then we tried to build the search functions in that, in that way. So let's shift a little bit to composers. You have- Very important subject in a publishing. Very important subject. You have uh, a lot of composers uh, whose works you publish, a lot of composers in your stable, a lot of composers that you have a relationship with, and I'm grateful to be one of them. If a composer writes, uh, a, a composer that you don't know, let's say, uh, for starters, if a composer writes a piece and they would like it to be published and they think that maybe you'd be the one to do it, how do they even submit that for starters to you? So this is a question we get a lot. And how do you bring it to the attention of a publisher? And each publisher is a little different, let me just say, on how they approach this. Uh, for us, we do look at submissions. And so we developed a portal on our website that's a submissions portal. And we've actually started asking our composers who have been with us for a long time to even use this portal. Uh, but you can go into that portal, submit. It asks you a few little questions to try to help categorize the music a bit, if it's sacred, if it's secular, just so it, it comes in right. And then it comes into our website, and into our, not website, but into our uh, software program so that we can see it and evaluate it. We don't have to have recordings, but it's nice to have recordings. And sometimes um, digital recordings are better than bad recordings. So uh, if you have a bad recording, it's better to not send any recording at all because immediately when you start to listen, if you're, if you're tempered by what you hear, you kind of you know, do a little bit of this. Um, but we do look at every piece that's submitted. Um, one of the things that about publishing, and one of the questions that was submitted earlier about this is um, about this whole submission process if you've never submitted before. And I'd say that one of the things that we look for is referrals. Uh, we look for people who have, for example, performed things. A uh, conductor often will say, hey, we just there's this wonderful young composer or this person, this piece that we just did, you know, and we had great success with that thought you would like to see it. Mm -hmm. Those things mean a great deal. And so if you're a composer and you're, you're looking to publish for the first time, it's really nice to have someone who's performing your music already, or at least that it's, we know it's out there in the world a little bit, getting a little bit of uh, attention or some things because I think you can you learn so much as a composer from listening to people perform your music or like I've had a lot of conductors who are composers say when I take my piece into the rehearsal process and then the choir refines it for me sometimes you know uh, you find out that doesn't really work right there you know uh, those are the kinds of things that help really refine a piece 
is there a, a general sense of, so, so you accept some pieces for publication and others you decide not to do. I imagine that there's as many reasons for that as there are submissions, but are there general things that yes. make things more likely to be accepted and less likely to be accepted? Sure, I, I would say, and I'll give you some statistics. This might be of interest to you. We started in this portal in November, and since November, we have um, rejected 214, I'm just gonna tell you choral numbers right now, 214 pieces that we've had to reject, uh, 76 that we have accepted, and we currently have 54 uh, sacred pieces to review and 32 secular pieces to review. That's what's come in since November, for example. Uh, the Just to give you an idea about it, I'd say one of the first things I look at is the text. I immediately look at the text because if there are any red flags in the text, I won't go beyond it. Doesn't matter what the music uh, really sounds like. Uh, You're not talking about poetry. You're talking about the way the text is set in, by the in the music, right? Oh well, a little bit of both. Okay. You know, I I know I know what I feel like our constituency is looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel like every, and every publisher does this, they know what their market is uh, and they know who's gonna be buying the kind of music that they publish. And so if it is a piece that is, let's say it's a piece of poetry that's very dated and has words that you don't really use anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I go back into the E.C. Chermer catalog and if you go back a few years ago, it's not uncommon to use the word gay as a happy thing and now sometimes the word gay can come off being wrong because it looks con the, the context looks wrong you know so that's a language piece that's changed for us so if you use the wrong poetry that's dated or could be offensive or could be certain you know there are certain songs that people have stopped using because they had connections to slavery or whatever. So I, I immediately look at those kinds of things. And then I approach the music. And then I look at how does it feel to me that that text matches the music? Um, and that's where I start working it, you know, and saying, hey, if I were singing this, do, do the words flow well, do the, and then I start getting into it deeper. So each, each step, takes me a little deeper into the piece. Um, many pieces are rejected simply because we have something else like that piece. You know, um, you played your Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing at the beginning, okay? Well, there has to be a certain length of time between the time when we publish a Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing to when I wanna publish another one, mm -hmm. for example. Um, or in the case of, for many years, Robert Frost poems, the Randall Thompson Frostiana was, were the only Robert Frost poems that were set. Uh, and so I have to really look and say, do I really want to add another stopping by the woods on a snowy evening to my catalog? Uh, because does that hurt me promoting the Randall Thompson stopping by the woods? Um, so those are kind of decisions that go into it. Uh, copyrights also make a big difference. If I know that the, the uh, poet is going to be hard to get a copyright from or something, then, then we will pass quick. Um, so there, there are lots of little criteria. Mm -hmm. So this leads me to a question which you, you may get a lot, um, which is the technology exists now for composers to compose their own music and then actually engrave their own music, some kind of computer program finale and Sibelius, I think are the big big two, but there's a bunch of others coming along um, where they would then promote their own music and not use a publisher at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so from your perspective, trying to figure out how to frame the question, uh, what are the advantages still? 
for composers to work with publishing companies and with you? It's a good, very good question. And I think it's a, it's a, a question that publishers struggle with as well, because it, there are certain pieces that may be better off self-published than there are to go through a publisher. It just really depends upon the genre, depends on what the kind of pieces are like. So let me give you, a, a, I'm gonna give you a couple of numbers that will shock you, I think. So be ready to be shocked. So <laughs> last year, uh, J.W. Pepper told us as a publisher that there were in 2019, there were 3,877 church choir pieces published, printed pieces, 4,500 school pieces. So about 9,000 choral pieces were published in 2019. Wow. New. New. Right? Wow. New pieces. And that's been continuing for every year. Mm. So we publish, as I mentioned earlier, you know, basically, you know, 70, 80 on the Morningstar side and, you know, a little less than that on the E.C. Shermer side. So we feel that you start with this big, it's like a funnel, you know, here's this big pool of, of compositions and they start funneling down to the customer. No conductor can look at 9,000 pieces of choral music in a year. So where, what do you do to get your pieces out to the market that you're most likely to be interested in? If you're going for a very select, if you wrote a piece that's for a very select kind of choir and it is a highly level concert piece that only a few choirs are going to do, you might be able to get attention for that pretty easily, you know. Uh, if it is, and, and you may not, a publisher may not be the best place for that. Uh, if you're writing a school piece and you want to get it in front of hundreds and hundreds of, of conductors, um, then maybe publishing is the way to go for that. Let me tell you what we do, and this will just help you. What we do is we edit, you know, when we get the piece, we edit that piece, we record the piece, we register the copyright, we register it with a performing rights society like ASCAP or BMI, we register it with Harry Fox to handle the mechanical licensing and the new music licensing collective and one license. And I will say that licensing is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger part of what we do. Uh, we then promote it to the music publisher, I mean, to the music dealers. And then we have a large set of what I call reviewers uh, so that it may go out to 200 conductors, for example, who are specialists in their different areas or we feel are the thought leaders in the industry. Um, it gets tagged and on our website that you mentioned, it gets put into a catalog, it gets featured on social media, it gets put into reading sessions for different places around the country. And then it always goes to like the appropriate ACDA r &S chair for consideration for reading sessions at ACDA or denominational if it's a church thing. And we know Methodists are going to be interested in this. It's going to go to certain things. If it's a vocal piece, it's going to get in front of the National Association of Teachers of Singing and their conference. And so basically we take all that and try to funnel it to who we think is very interested and um, then we collect that money and send it back and forth to the publisher, I mean, to the composer. And we also pay, in the case of Mr. Thompson here, his grandchildren, uh, because the copyright it goes 70 years past his death. So those are all kinds of things that go into publishing of a single piece that um, if, composers want to handle all that themselves certainly can, but the larger catalog that they build, the harder it is to control all of those kinds of things. And that is not even taking into consideration if they wrote a piece that needs orchestral parts or instrumental parts or those kinds of things. So I think there's still a real need for publishing and I think that there is the room for the self-publishing as well. Nice. 
through most of my career, um, I would find music, program music, teach the music, and then perform the music, uh, either in a church sanctuary or in a concert hall for live audiences. And that was kind of the way it all, that's just the way it worked. And even just before the COVID pandemic started, more and more people started to put performances or, or fragments of performances onto social media, onto YouTube, onto mm -hmm. streaming sites. And then the pandemic accelerated that because we weren't able to perform at all. You mentioned mechanical licenses and stuff. We do, probably don't want to get too far down in the weeds, but how did the pandemic affect you, affect the company, and affect such things as copyrights and licenses and all sure. those kinds of things going forward? It's a big, big question, but maybe you can. Uh, I'll try to. Better. I'll try to make it short because <laughs> it is. It's a whole program in itself. Yeah. Um, so prior to the pandemic, publishers really did not know what to do about the YouTube um, phenomenon that had happened and people putting things on the site because most of it was illegal. Mm. And yet publishers don't like to go after people. People do not, they do not like to go out and try to sue people. It's expensive. It's not good practice. We were trying to encourage people to perform our music. So often people were looking at it as a promotional kind of thing. Well, it's good. That choir's out there singing this. Other people will see it. It's, so it was kind of written off as promotional material. Mm -hmm. But everybody knew that eventually there had to be more control over this because in many ways, the money that we used to be going into mechanical license for making CDs uh, and recordings has shifted to being now people don't make as many recordings they maybe put more things online and and so that money we have an obligation because we've signed a contract with the composer to enforce the copyright collect the money off of that so publishers quickly tried to put into place better guidance about how to get a synchronization license which is the word for uh, what you need for a youtube performance for example um, the problem is our, our publishing companies, the copyright is so uh, controlled by the government that a mechanical license has a single fee that everyone pays no matter what it is. Yet the same people who collect mechanical licenses cannot collect sync licenses hmm. because by law. So every publisher has to grant a synchronization license individually by itself. And that then makes it confusing for the consumer. So it was really a tough thing. Uh, we've done a good job of trying to pivot, make it easy, but there are certain questions that have to be asked and all that kind of stuff. And so sync licensing has certainly risen. And for churches, the streaming of worship services, new things have come along to help make that easier through one license and CCLI. And that has made a big difference because that income has shifted tremendously um, into a now a use mode where it's used, we get paid, the composer gets paid, uh, mm. you know, and all that money is split 50-50 usually with the composer. So mm. uh, that so so that is greatly changed, and that's why it's much more complicated than it used to be. I hope that was succinct enough. Incredibly succinct. I hear in your voice that it is complicated and that it is evol it is evolving and has evolved. Um, I don't hear in your voice a sense of, of panic or, or fraughtness. So uh, is it fair to say that while I'm sure it's still evolving and more needs to be done as the technology continues to shift, is it fair to say that where we are now is is pretty good that we're further forward than we were a couple of years ago? Yes, in, in regards to that, I think we are. I think there's still some misunderstandings in the industry, you know, uh, people don't like to go to a conference and sit in an hour long session on copyright. You know, they'd rather get it some other way, but uh, there's more and more uh, movement for people understanding what to do and then publishers have make making it easier too. Um, and that's, that's that's going to happen because it, it is going it's not going away. It's only going to get more involved actually. 
Nice. Jim, have, um, I know that we always uh, in, invite the folks that are on this call, on this Zoom conversation, to ask any questions that they might have. Have there been any? There have been uh, a few, actually. And uh, this one, I think, Mark, would be relatively easy. It says, when you say sacred about the library, do you mean Christian, or does it embrace other religious traditions? I'm sorry, when it's, can you repeat the? Sure. When you say sacred as far as music, do you mean Christian or does it embrace other religious traditions? It, it, it's primarily Christian. It also, on the E.C. Shermer side, has a fairly significant uh, Jewish uh, catalog for use in, in Jewish worship. Beyond that, there's not much else that has the choral tradition. And so that tends to be primarily uh, what it is, uh, the, the choral tradition is really where we focus on that, so. I will say just for myself, uh, c composers and conductors are fairly recently uh, becoming more aware of sacred traditions that are um, transcendent and uh, Pro profoundly moving, but aren't quite Christian, where I'm going with that awkward sentence, is uh, I've recently composed a piece by the Persian composer Rumi. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be published through one of your series, right? Um, so there are some things out there as composers. Uh, there, there really isn't a choral tradition uh, from that, that area of the world, but there are poets coming out of that area of the world. And I think more and more composers are going to begin to explore those those poets. Right. And I maybe I didn't probably expand enough. There are quite a few texts that have come out of sacred traditions other than Christian, but they're primarily in music that is written to be multicultural and is sung in schools and colleges more than it is in churches. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, we have another question, and then I have a comment that I'm going to share with you that came in. Uh, Laurel, as a composer, wrote this. As a composer, I have a handful of pieces that I'm interested in sending to publishers, but don't have quality recordings of many of them. One was even a competition winner, but the recording uh, I received was poor. And the, ped and the pandemic and finding choirs to perform the works has gotten difficult. Would it be better to wait to send works to publishers until I've gotten a quality recording or better chance of finding choirs to perform the works and getting them published? I think I would wait just a little while. And I, uh, this is part of the result of the pandemic was that publishers stopped publishing because we had no one to sell it to. So most people are backed up in that we have a lot of pieces to release or that we actually released maybe right before the pandemic that didn't get any attention because there was no one that could sing them. So we're, we're I know we feel we're about a year mm. behind. And so uh, I know for people, it's frustrating if you've sent in a piece to be reviewed and it feels like it's slow, but we don't, uh, we don't have the crystal ball to figure out how fast we're gonna move out of this. Uh, that we're in. So we're all kind of backed up just a little bit. And I know that there are some publishers who aren't, recept aren't receiving anything new at this point because they have to work through what they currently have. So that's, that's been one of the effects of the pandemic is this backlog of publications that we do not feel have had any attention at this point. Thank you. Thank you. And one was a, a, just a, a wonderful comment from Stan. He says, thank you for quality sacred works published by Morningstar, predominantly the choral selections, but especially for the unique quality string sacred solo works. They're exceptional. So just wanted to pass that on to you. We would have sent it to you, but we had time to get it in here. <laughs> and uh, another question just rolled in. Uh, I'm a big fan of Eric Nelson's music. and I've always been impressed with Mark's business acumen and stewardship of this company. Is there a, an initiative to include or seek out composers of color or those who are underrepresented? Yes, there is. And uh, we've added a number of people uh, in this past year to our catalog um, that were people of color. You know, this is actually something that we've struggled with a bit 
because we often do not know when someone submits by looking at a name if they're a person of color. I mean, we don't ask for a, a picture. We don't ask for an identification of race. We don't know, you know, so if it's not people we've worked with before, we really don't, we don't know um, unless there's something there that's, that says who this person is. So um, we, we struggle with making sure we're trying to do our very best at recruiting young composers, recruiting women composers, all, all kinds. I would honestly say that the first look at a piece of music by no means has any connotation about what that is. Everybody's music is looked at the same, no matter what, at, at, at that beginning time, you know. Um, and our company has always had a very strong history of influential women composers. The number of pieces we have by that started with K.K. Davis, Gwyneth Walker, Alice Parker, just a lot. And then on the Galaxy side, the work of John Work is very important. Um, and we've had a you know strong connections with the Alvin Ailey Dance Club Company, so that the Revelation Dance, many of those pieces are owned by Galaxy and in our choral catalog. So there's been a strong connection with composers of color over the years. There's never enough. You know, uh, I would say, and same way with women composers, there hasn't been enough, but the number of pe pieces that we have accepted, the percentage is higher for those groups than it would be probably uh, in others. So we, we continue to work at that. Okay. And there's still a few here. Uh, some of them we had discussed, they were sent to us in advance. Uh, we discussed, I think, before we went live. Um, and one of those is, what are the best ways for composers to pitch unsolicited scores to arrive at times in ways the publishers prefer? So uh, that's where I would go back to say, it, publishers, I know we, I know we don't, we don't like to review pieces in isolation from other pieces. And I think conductors are like this too. It's not like when you see a piece of music that you go, I've got to perform that piece. You know, you're kind of saying, I'm crafting a Christmas program. So what do I need title-wise in that Christmas program? That's kind of how we approach, for example, publishing. What's our Christmas representation this year? Well, I want to wait a while. I want to see a lot of the pieces that I'm going to be considering at one time rather than making a decision immediately on that. Um, so the timing of a piece often depends on how long it takes. If it's a Christmas piece, it gets held until we look at other Christmas pieces. Uh, if, it's a, if it's an Easter piece, it may get held until we can look at other pieces that compare to that. Um, we don't like to leave things in our review folder for more than a month or two, but the initial, the initial review happens fast. If it makes it past the initial review, the second review may be a little longer, uh, simply because we're trying to compare it with other things that we have and see if it fits a hole or something like that. So again, recommendations are really good. Uh, we, uh, Good, good recordings, good recommendations, those kinds of things are real important. Okay, and, and another one just came in. Uh, is permanently out of print still a thing or do those pieces remain available digitally? And if they go out of print, do, do composers get the copyright back? Uh, good questions. Uh, different with different publishers. Uh, many publishers would take a piece so the old time practice, let me back up. The old time practice was that you would take a piece out of print because it cost X amount of dollars to make a print run. When print on demand became a thing, it became less important to take it out of print. Although it's harder to promote 15,000 titles than it is 3,000 titles. So some publishers still take it out of print. Uh, it depended upon the practice of the publishing company, whether the copyright was offered back to the family or the person or not. Um, so you will find it with different companies, different practices. In our company, most often they were offered the copyright back. 
they might choose to take the copyright back. They may say, keep it. Maybe one of these days you'll put the piece back into print. Uh, so every time we come up with a permanently out of print piece of music, which for example, a lot of the work of John Work was out of print and we'd like to bring it back, but the copyright reverted to the family and now we can't find many family members. So we're, it's kind of hung there knowing what to do um, and whether we can find someone who can still give us permission to do it. If it's under our copyright, we could do anything we want to at this point, you know, uh, to pre-promote that piece. Um, so that that's kind of the question is some companies do not return the copyrights, some do. Okay. So you can't make a blanket statement. Let me jump in here as time is getting a little long and uh, and say to you once again, how grateful I am, honored I am to be one of the composers that is represented in Morningstar and ECS, and also for your willingness to shepherd the Atlanta Massacrell Choral Series. I'm curious if you remember, I think it was at a Chorus America conference, if I remember the story correctly, um, it, what it is about what we do in Atlanta Master Corral that, that made you feel like we were a good fit for each other? Well, I felt like that uh, your love for hymnody is one thing, because that was one of the things that we uh, did a lot of work with, uh, was these taking the hymns that people often would relate to uh, and giving them more depth or of expression that allowed for them to really soak into that piece. That was the first things that we noticed. And I think maybe the Children of the Heavenly Father may have been one of the first things that we actually published, but the Come Thou Found of Every Place. Those kinds of things were the things that first caught my attention. And then of course you expanded out of that in many ways to include other things such as When Memory Fades, which was a great piece. And then you've done the Joel Thompson pieces that uh, have made it into the Galaxy Catalog. So, so as Atlanta Master Corral expanded, so could we expand that, that catalog, which is great. And let me mention how you can actually find that. If you go to our website and you go to the choral music section and you click, you get three choices. You get sacred, school, or all. And if you push all and you go to the left, you can see that there's a button that says series. Pull the series button down, choose Atlanta Master Crown, and you get everything that's in the series. So pretty easy. Fantastic. Before Jim gives uh, closing comments, um, let me just ask you, in general, now that we are coming out of the pandemic, and you've already talked a little bit about the backlog and how things are getting rolling again. What are you most excited about and looking forward to uh, for the company? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, one of the things is that when choirs start back, they may be smaller, but at the same time, this is what I'm hopeful for. I think they're going to be enthusiastic the singers who are actually singing are going to want to sing so badly and perform so badly uh, in good ways. I didn't mean they <laughs> want to perform badly, but they want to perform. And that that enthusiasm has the ability of giving even more surge to the membership in the future. Mm -hmm. And that the, the enthusiasm of a choir member wanting to see other people sing with them, I think could be a great thing. And I think that we will see uh, in the coming year very creative programming. I think we'll see this blend of live concerts and digital concerts that are there, going to be there. I'm, I'm excited about where this is going to take us. It may take us a little while to get there still, but I, I feel very, very hopeful about the state of choral music um, as we go forward. Thank you, Mark. Jim? Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, judging by the fact that none of the participants have left, um, that tells me that we could probably continue this conversation for a good long time, because I think that there's more than we could have even touched on today. So thank you very much for, for this. Maybe we'll reschedule another session down the road here in our series. Um, just want to thank everyone for, for participating today, especially for the great questions we've had. Um, you'll receive a follow-up email 
uh, that'll include the information about all the upcoming Spirited Conversations and their guests. Our next guest will be Sam Hagen, uh, a world-renowned tenor who was among the first black members of the Emory University Glee Club. Um, he has sung locally, internationally with some of the greatest uh, operas, orchestras. I think it'll be a fascinating discussion if you can tune in. Uh, all the information will be in that email and it's available on our website. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. As I said, our uh, upcoming concert series uh, for the new season, uh, the Spirit of Conversations, all our virtual uh, programming is available on our website, atlantamastercrawl.org. Uh, if there's any other questions, you know, please feel free to send them to us. Uh, and in the meantime, have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.